Heavenly Father, our great comfort in life is that your promises preserve our lives. And so, Lord, we pray that you would ask, that we, we ask of you now that you would send your spirit to us and help us to meditate upon your promises and to delight in the life that we have through your promises. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, as we come to prepare ourselves to consider the baptisms of Matthew and Simone and Nathan and Liz, I thought it'd be helpful for us to look at what has happened to Matthew and to Simone and to Nathan and to Liz. And the way the Bible describes, one of the ways that the Bible describes what has happened to them is by what we see in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, a religious leader comes to Jesus. Jesus has been ministering and we have this religious leader who comes and recognises that Jesus is a great teacher. We see that in verse 2. Nicodemus comes and he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And so Jesus then has this opportunity, this man has come to him, to teach him some great truth. And what is it that Jesus teaches him? Well, it's that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. We see in verse 3, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What is Jesus doing here? Well, he's teaching Nicodemus the most important thing that a human can know. What's that? Well, it's how we enter the kingdom of God, how we can enter heaven itself, how we can be one of God's citizens in his kingdom. But what needs to happen in order for someone to enter the kingdom of God, to enter heaven itself? Well, Jesus says that they must be born again. Verse 3, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So what then does it mean to be born again? Does it mean some sort of new physical birth that we need to go through? Well, Nicodemus recognised the impossibility of that. What do we read in verse 4? How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. It's a logical impossibility, a physical impossibility for you to be born again by your mother. So then what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be born again? Well, it means that God has changed. God has changed a person. And the word that is used often uh, to describe this change is regeneration. You've been regenerated so that a person is made a new person. And that's what we read in verse 5 and 6 that the Holy Spirit has worked on someone so that they are changed. Verse 5 says, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, that's the first birth, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And so there's this understanding that the second birth is where the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates someone and makes them a new person, a new spiritual person. Now, it doesn't mean that the old person is completely gone. Matthew is still Matthew, Simone is still Simone, Nathan is still Simone, and Liz is still Liz. But they are a new person. They've been regenerated in some way so that they're a new person. Now, how do we know that someone has experienced the new birth, that someone has been regenerated? Well, there is usually pain. And that makes sense. When you think of your first birth, what happens? There is pain. There is contractions that take place in order for someone to be born the first time. And it's the same with the new birth. There is pain and there's contractions happening. What am I speaking of? Well, I'm speaking of spiritual pain that is experienced by someone who is, knowing the new, is going through the second birth. And what's that? Well, it's a mourning over sin. There's a painful mourning over sin the way that we have broken God's holy laws. There's a mourning and pain that's felt over the punishment that we deserve for our sins as we understand that there is a judgment and that there is punishment, an eternal punishment of hell for those who've sinned against God. And there's a painful humbling of your spirit and a feeling of helplessness before God and before all of men. 
this is one of the signs that someone has experienced the new birth, is that there's a pain associated with their birth. And what else do we see? Well, we know that someone cries for help. If someone has experienced a new birth, they have cried for help. And that makes sense as well. How do we know if a baby is born the first time? How do we know it is born? Well, it cries. It cries for help. And it will trust anyone that picks it up and looks after it in that moment. It's there in its helplessness and it cries out wanting someone to alleviate its concerns. And usually it's hunger that's there or the light that's there. It wants to be in a warm place like it used to experience. And so it's crying out for help. And it's the same with the new birth. The new birth. To be born again means that the new baby has cried. Cried in his helplessness or her helplessness and then trusted God to help. Has cried out to God for help. What help does a person need? Well, they've recognised that they're a sinner and that they deserve punishment for their sin and so they come to God and ask for help. Wash my sins away. And they trust God to do so. They trust that Jesus is their Messiah, that he is their Christ, their Saviour, and that at the cross, Jesus bore their sins, and so therefore he took the punishment that they deserved upon his shoulders at the cross. And so they come and they trust God, just like a newborn infant trusts the parent that's there to welcome it into the world, to nourish it and look after it. They cry out for help, and God nourishes them and gives them the Saviour that they need, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this in 1 John chapter 5, another book of the Bible, where it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Saviour, is born of God. Everyone who believes in Jesus is born of God. So how do we know that someone is born again? Well, they've cried, they've experienced, physical, they've experienced some spiritual pain, they've also cried out to God for help. How else do we know that someone has been born again? Well, they love others. And this makes sense as well. How do we know that someone has been born the first time? Well, they don't stay a baby, they grow up and they develop love and affection for those around them. Who do they love? Well, they love their parents. They have this desire to be around their parents always. They get worried if mum's too far away from them. They love their parents and we know that they love them even as they get older because what do they do? They obey their parents. They don't obey everybody but they obey their parents out of a love for them. And who else do they love? Well they love their brothers and their sisters, the rest of the family and they even love other people outside the family unit, particularly their own nation. There's a real sense of identity that these are my people and they have an affection for them. And that shows that they have been born, that they're an actual person living in this world. And it's the same for the second birth. When someone has been born again, born of the Spirit, born of God, what do we see? Well, they love those around them. They love those around them. And we read this in 1 John as well. It says, everyone who loves has been born of God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. Now, who does a newborn a new born-again person love? Well, firstly, they love God. They love God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They love God the Father for loving them and sending the Son, and they love the Son for dying in their place so they could be born again. And they love the Holy Spirit for taking the blood of Jesus and cleansing their hearts and for giving them a new spirit within them, for giving them a new heart, for washing away the old man and bringing a new man into existence. And how do we know that they love God? A newborn Christian loves God? Well, they keep his commands. What do we read in John chapter 14, verse 15? If you love me, you will obey what I command. Jesus says, if you love me, I'll, you will obey what I command. And so we see that the newborn Christian is someone who's obedient to God. But who else does a newborn Christian love? Well, he loves the rest of the family, doesn't he? He loves brothers and sisters in Christ, who are now his family. And he loves, in fact, everyone. He loves his neighbour as himself. And that means all of humanity, even his enemies. Many people are born the first time and they grow up to love, but they do not grow up to love their enemies. But the newborn Christian grows in love and affection for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the brothers and sisters in Christ, but also for his neighbours, but also even for his enemies. 
He has a love for them and a desire to see good things happen to them and particularly for them to know the God that he knows. And so we see that someone who has been born again is someone who's experienced pain. They've cried out for help in that pain and then they've grown in love for others. But why is it important to be born again and to look for signs of life? Why should we be looking at Matthew and Simone and Nathan and Liz today and seeing signs of new life in them, seeing signs that they have been born again? Well, it's because if they have been born again, then they have received a particular life. And that's what we understand, that if you've been born the first time, you've experienced life. You've come into this world. You're alive. And it's the same with the second birth. When someone is born again, they've experienced an eternal life. They've entered into the kingdom of God and they will enter into the kingdom of heaven one day. They will be in heaven itself, in paradise. Even though they die, they will experience living in heaven with Christ and his people. And why is that important? Why is it important to have eternal life? Well, because joy comes with true life. And we see this, it makes sense. When you're born the first time, Babies do cry, but they also enjoy life. A baby that is alive enjoys life. You see them enjoy the simplest of things. A game of peekaboo with a child. They just delight in it. You're there, you're not there. You're there, you're not there. They love it and they delight in it and they laugh at the simplest of things. Our daughter, when she was really small, she would come and she'd say, Mummy, 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 Mummy. And Jill would think that she was upset about something and she would say, what's wrong? And she'd hold up a little piece of fluff and say, fluff. She went about the house always finding fluff and bringing it to us and with great joy that look what I found, some fluff. Children enjoy being alive. And it's the same with the newborn Christian. The person who's been born again, there's a joy in their hearts. They delight in life. And they even delight in looking forward to a greater joy that is yet to come. They will rejoice in heaven itself where there's no more pain, there's no more death, there's no more crying, there's no suffering, there's no more tears. There's just joy in the Lord in heaven itself. And it's not just the person who receives joy. It's also the rest of the family who rejoices in the newborn's existence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they rejoice in the new life. This is why it's so important to recognise the new life that's there, because God is rejoicing. And then the brothers and sisters, they rejoice as well just like the rest of the family with a newborn baby rejoices in its existence and then as it grows older they rejoice in it, so it's the same with the rest of the family of God. They rejoice that someone has been brought into existence with eternal life now. They have eternal life and they will be with them for eternity in heaven. So this is why it's so important to recognise whether someone has been born again. Have they experienced a mourning and a pain over their sin? Have they cried out to God for help? Have they trusted in God as their saviour, trusted that the Lord Jesus died in their place? Are they someone who loves those around them and loves God himself? It's because there is a great joy in that person's life and a great joy for us as we recognise the newborn Christian. And what else is a result of this new birth? Well, it's glory to God for doing it all. When babies are born the first time, there is glory. For who? The parents. We come to the parents and we say congratulations. And particular glory goes to whom? The mum. I mean, she's the one who's done most of the work. The father contributed, but mum did most of the work. He may have been there feeding her ice and holding her hand, but... He is, uh, she is the one who has done the work, and so she gets the glory. Most people will focus on him. The father gets a handshake, the wife gets a hug, the mother gets a hug, and well done. And it's the same with the new birth. There is glory. And who gets the glory? Totally God. 
God gets the glory. It, why? Because it's totally of God. People don't choose to be born the first time. All of us who are in this room, we didn't choose to be born into this world. And it's the same for the newborn Christian. They didn't actually choose to become a Christian. It was God who worked upon their heart by the Holy Spirit and washed them with the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so who gets the glory? It's God who gets the glory. So this is what the new birth is. And this is what has happened for those who are being baptised today. For Matthew, for Simone, for Nathan and Liz. They have been born again. How do we know? Well, we've seen changes. You should have seen changes. If you were close to any of these people, you should have seen changes in their lives. In recent months, if they've been recently born again, or if they've been born again for some time, a Christian's been born for, again for some time, you can see changes in their life. What sort of changes? Well, they've gone through the labour pains. There's been a mourning over sin and the punishment that we deserve in hell. And there's been a humbling process in their lives. And what else has happened? They've cried for help. That all newborn Christians cry. Cry for help. They've cried out to the Lord to help them in their distress and to save them from their sin and their punishment for sin. And what else has happened? Well, they've developed a new love for others. For who? They've developed a love for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they've also developed a love for other Christians. They love brothers and sisters in Christ. And what else? Well, they also love other humans. They should be much more kind to you and gentle and loving towards you. And even their enemies, they're now demonstrating a, a love and a concern for those who are not kind to them. And what else has happened to those being baptised? Matthew and Simone and Nathan and Liz? Well, they've also rejoiced. They've felt the pain. They've cried out for help. They've started to love those that they didn't love before. And they've also known a great joy. They've rejoiced in the eternal life that they now have and all its benefits that are coming to them. And so the joy means that the labour pains are forgotten and they rejoice in God and look forward to the eternal joy in heaven. And they bring joy to the rest of the family. Who? God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are rejoicing over the new birth of Matthew and Simone and Nathan and Liz. And they bring joy to the rest of the family the brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is a joyous occasion for us at Dremoyne Baptist. It's a wonderful occasion for us. Why? Well, we rejoice that four newborns are part of our family, part of the Christian family, and they have eternal life with us. They will live with us for eternity in glory. And so there's joy in our hearts. This is a joyous occasion for us at Dremoyne Baptist. All baptisms are joyous occasions because we're rejoicing that someone has experienced the new birth and has eternal life with us. And what else has happened in the lives of Matthew and Simone and Nathan and Liz so that we know that they're newborns? Well, they're people who give glory to God now. They give glory to God for everything that has happened to them, which is why they're being baptised today. Why are they being baptised today? Well, they want to declare that they have been born again. They want to make it known to their brothers and sisters here at Dremoyne Baptist Church, but also to their friends and family. They want to say that I'm a new person. Now, why does baptism, why does going into this baptistry behind us in a body full of water and going down into it and coming back up again, what does that signify? How does that give glory to God? Well, it signifies that a greater baptism has taken place within this is an outward baptism that you'll see today, but the important baptism is the inward baptism where they have been immersed into the blood of Jesus Christ and have come up with a resurrection life in Christ Jesus, that the old man has been washed away. They've experienced a new birth, and so they're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But how does a baptism give glory to God? Well... God has commanded that they do this, so he is glorified and honoured when they follow their, in his command that they should be baptised, but also even the way that they are baptised. They don't baptise themselves. They are baptised. They will be baptised. It's passive to them. And what does that show? Well, it shows that the inward baptism was passive as well, that they didn't choose to be baptised by the Holy Spirit, that Spirit 
baptised them. He brought about the birth. And so therefore, as they are baptised by someone else, by either Joshua or myself today, they are showing that God gets the glory, that he is the one who has done this for them. And how else does he get the glory? Well, they stand here and unashamedly tell you. And we'll see that today. Before they are baptised, they declare that they are sinners, but that Christ is an even greater saviour and that he has saved them from their sins. And so that's Matthew, Simone, Nathan and Liz. We can see that they have been born again and they will declare that to you with their own mouths today and by their actions of being baptised. But what about you? Have you been born again? Have you known the labour pains of the new birth, the spiritual pains, the mourning over your sin and its punishment, the humbling of your pride, and the feeling of helplessness. Have you cried the cry of a new infant, a cry of helplessness, trusting Christ's body and blood given for you? And have you grown and developed a, a new love? Do you love God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for giving you birth and bringing you into his family? Do you love brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love all humans? Do you even love your neighbours as yourself and your enemies? And have you known the joy of having eternal life, of knowing that this world is not your home, but you're part of a greater kingdom that extends beyond this world to a new heavens and a new earth. And have you then given glory to God, given glory to God, acknowledging what he has done for you in giving you the new birth? If you have, I encourage you, continue to glorify God, continue to rejoice and love God and fellow humans. But maybe you don't know the joy of the new birth. You don't know the joy of the new birth, but you feel that something is happening to you now. Labour pains are happening. Contractions are happening for you. They may, be, they may have been happening for some time now, or it may be just starting now, as I am even speaking to you now. What are the labour pains you may be experiencing? Well, you feel that something is different about you, that you are interested in God in a way that you haven't been previously. What else? Well, you might be feeling that you're not as wise as you once thought you were and that ignoring God and the world that is to come is not as wise as you thought. You may be feeling sorrow for your sins, feeling sorrow as you consider that you are not as nice a person as you once thought you were. And you're also feeling sorrow over the punishment that you know is coming for you, for your sin, for your rebellion against God. And so you're concerned for your soul and you're concerned about what will happen in the afterlife. And what else are you feeling? What other labour contractions may be happening at this time for you or have been happening for even many months for you? There's a humbling process that you're going through that's very unpleasant. No one likes to be humbled. Always encouraging self-esteem. Be proud of yourself. But as you have been considering God, and yourself and your sin and the punishment that you deserve for sin. You're being progressively humbled. And you find yourself wanting to enter the kingdom of God. You're wanting to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're wanting to have eternal life. To know the joy of being in heaven itself. And rejoicing for all eternity in a place without pain and suffering and death and crying and mourning. If that is you you're feeling something is different about your life and you're concerned about spiritual matters as never before, I encourage you to embrace the Spirit's work. Embrace the Spirit's work. Don't be a baby that doesn't want to come out, that wants to stay where it is. Be a baby that wants to come out. We all know that we cannot live in this world unless we are born. No one lives in this world unless they are born the first time. No human just appears here. And it's the same with the kingdom of God. It's the same with the kingdom of God. You cannot live in the new world. You cannot live in heaven unless you are born again. And we see this repeatedly given to us in the text. John chapter 3, verse 3, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Then look with me at verse 5. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. 
And verse 7, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. No one goes to heaven unless they're born again, unless they've had those contractions happening to them. And so I encourage you, if you are feeling something is different, something is happening, embrace what is happening in your life. Embrace the painful contractions. Know that the baby is coming and soon you will be a new person. Cry the cry of a newborn baby. Cry in your helplessness to God for mercy. He extends mercy to those who cry for him. He hears the cry and he extends mercy to that child. Receive life eternal and therefore joy eternal. And give glory to God for his kindness to you and love others with the new life that he has given you. I encourage you this morning, if you are not born again, don't experience the labor contractions that you may be feeling even now and be a baby who dies in the womb, who never comes out and experiences the eternal life that comes through God. Let's come to God in prayer now. Let's speak with him. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God who has the power and the love to grant new birth to sinful humans. Oh Lord, we thank you for regenerating, for giving the new birth to Matthew, to Simone, to Nathan and to Liz and to many others in this room and for granting us eternal life and joy in yourself. Oh Lord, we ask though that you would help us to continue to love others and to give glory to you for the new birth that we have experienced. But Lord, if there is anyone here who has not been born again, oh Lord, we ask that you would send your spirit and regenerate them now so that they live forever with joy and give you the glory that you deserve. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.